I'm Rick Wonderman. I study volcanoes at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I am in a group called the Global Volcanism Program, and we have dedicated ourselves to having partners all over the world that watch volcanoes erupt. They send us information. We put those together into a a, a report with context and background, and we kind of are a repository, just like many other aspects of the Smithsonian, of information. Okay, we're going to talk about what drives a volcano, and it's not obvious, and I'm going to use a little prop here. It's going to be a soda bottle. This is seltzer. No sugar in this particular one. But dissolved in this, as we all know from opening these things and playing with them, there are gases. And you can't tell by looking at it, can you? But when I release the pressure by opening this, it's very analogous to a volcano, probably under, underground, a long distance. This channel, this passageway, is sealed at some point, and then at some point it opens. That degassing you just witnessed is what goes on, and that's so important to drive through the neck of this, the material out, be it in a fairly gentle way or be it in a violent way. And we've all dealt with the problem of having to shake in a bit. Maybe you didn't know your sister did it when she handed you the can. But the fact is, is that foamy stuff that comes out is really difficult to deal with. The case of a volcano, that stuff freezes chills below the solid, as it's called. It, ch it chills to get hard. And that hard stuff, even though it's not foamy and flowy, is still a problem. And that's what basically volcanic ash is. Volcanoes erupt in many different ways, and it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, get a handle in all the ways. Many are not this wonderful cone-shaped uh, uh, construct, construct. Many are actually depressions. In fact, some of the depressions are linear, you know, fissures. Some on the ocean floor are chains of volcanoes in fissure form that are 70,000 kilometers long. So, you know, there's, and that's under the ocean. So there's many, many kinds. And in fact, Iceland is relevant here because Iceland is the one of the few places on the planet, maybe the only, where extensive areas of this ridge, oceanic ridge, where crust is being formed and spreading is going on, is out of the water. You can watch it without getting your feet wet, without a boat. You can stand on Iceland, and there is Iceland spreading apart at several centimeters a year, and volcanoes are erupting. What we have going on is a reasonably small, mild, moderate, I mean, I won't say totally moderate, but you know, not a huge eruption. And we have strong winds that happen to be blowing consistently toward northern Europe. That pattern has happened a lot in Icelandic eruptions. This is no surprise. We have seen this happen in many of the larger eruptions. And just to give you a feeling for the size of this eruption so far, it probably isn't even at a quarter of a cubic kilometer, or it's about some number like that in terms of volume of output so far. The largest eruption we've seen there in historical times was 18 cubic kilometers. And that caused giant effects of the climate in northern Europe, and, and a thing called the dry fogs, and, and really a whole lot of acid rain, and really difficult conditions. If you think about Iceland as a country, and this sort of anomalous thing where it's really like the seafloor, the volcanoes there are really quite peculiar in that they have this linear shape following the ridge, as you might expect, and they often behave several at a time together, or a region at a time, a segment of the ridge, if you will, at a time together, and they're thought of as one magmatic system that's connected. And that's the case that we have here with the volcano at hand and, and the neighboring volcano, Katla. And so, Katla is connected and they often erupt together. Katla is like the big brother and it's often the more violent and the more voluminous eruptions and it also erupts more often, uh, you know, and more, more demonstrably, if you will. So we have something like 20 known eruptions from that one and about three from the volcano at hand. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interconnected system and it's possible uh, that the, the Katla wakes up and is a, makes, it makes for a bigger boom than we have now. Nobody really knows. People ask me often how long an eruption will last, and I say, well, globally, most eruptions, 10% end in one day. The average is seven weeks, and a long one generally is 1,000 days, about three years, and uh, about 10% go on longer than that.